Thanks so very much for being with us. Um, I am Mandy White Ajmani. This is our sixth webinar of our 2021 2022 series. Uh, we are Small Brooklyn Psychology, and today our guru of evidence based therapy treatment, Jill DiPietro, is going to inform us about all the many different kinds of therapy approaches um, that we can help with your kids. Um, there are so many acronyms and uh, you know what? You just wanna find the best thing that's gonna work well for your family. So she's gonna help us to understand the options and what to look for. So I am Mandy White-Ajmani, the owner of Small Brooklyn Psychology. We are a group psychology practice at Industry City in Brooklyn, New York, where we offer therapy and neuropsychological assessment for people of all ages, all backgrounds, all psychological concerns. Jill, can you go ahead and show, uh, share your screen? We have uh, lovely pictures of all of our clinicians. We have nine different clinicians, uh, four neuropsychologists and five therapists who all work with people of all ages. Uh, that's me down there on the left side, then Natasha Brown, there's Jill DePietro who's gonna talk to us today, Sam Janit, Deidre Edwards, Nav Gill, Ben Janitis, Maddie Lawler, and Danielle DePilippo. And we all have experience working with people across the lifespan, but we definitely have special training and experience to do assessment and treatment with kids uh, and their parents, even down to babies and toddlers. So if there's any sort of developmental question that you have, we'd be happy to help you with, and, and behavioral issue, uh, we'd be happy to help you with the young ones, but then we work with uh, kids, adolescents, young adults, older adults, um, feel free to reach out. So as I said, this is our sixth webinar in our in this year's monthly series. Recordings for our previous talks are, um, we have several from last year. We have our entire series this year. It's all stored for free on our website at smallbrooklyn.com slash services slash talks. And we cover a lot of ground. We give tips on managing behavior at home and in a classroom. We talk about what a neuropsychological evaluation is and how it can help, what all the different kinds of evaluations are. We talk about how to understand mental health issues in children and adults. We talk about how to take care of yourselves as parents. Um, and so Jill's talk today is going to join the annals of that lovely library. Uh, and then next month is going to be our last webinar in our series. It's gonna be on April 6th. And psychologist Sam Janit is going to talk to us about bullying. His talk is gonna focus on how parents can support their child's mental health, um, not only when they are being bullied, but also when they are sometimes the bully. And I think that's really important. It's very stressful for parents in so many ways, but also very stressful for kids, whether they are the victim or the perpetrator. Um, so he's gonna give us information about how to manage that for our kids, as well as how to manage our own stress about it too. Registration for that is gonna go up in a couple of days. So watch out for it. This series is media sponsored by Park Slope Parents, which is our amazing local community resource. If you are a parent in Brooklyn and you're not on Park Slope Parents, I highly recommend it. Even if you are not in Brooklyn, there's actually just so much information that is shared that is, uh, has been super helpful for me personally, not only as a parent, but also as a small business owner. They have separate subgroups that talk about um, business and careers and cultural backgrounds and interests like cooking and gardening and sports and tabletop gaming and all kinds of really cool stuff. Um, and they've been really great about helping to connect people in in-person meetups, virtual meetups, and then also just sharing just lots of been there, done that sorts of experience and advice. So highly recommended. And we always really appreciate them for helping to promote, to promote our talks so everybody knows about them. All right, so during this talk, if you have any questions for Jill, type them to me in the Q&A box. I'm gonna monitor them while Jill does her presentation. And then we're gonna come back together for a conversation about everything at the end. And so without further ado, I will introduce Jill DePietro, who's been such an integral part of our therapy team, and we're just so grateful to have her. So thanks for being with us, Jill. Jill is a licensed clinical social worker who specializes in the diagnostic evaluation and treatment of children and adolescents with um, ADHD, disruptive and oppositional behaviors, selective mutism, autism spectrum disorder, anxiety, all kinds of other behavior and emotional disorders. She has extensive experience in providing parent-child interaction therapy, PCIT. She's gonna help us explain what all this is, by the way. SMPCIT, which is a treatment for selective mutism, parent management training, PMT, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, and social skills training. Uh, she's also just been so generous in sharing her knowledge. Uh, she gives multiple webinars to the community. She uh, supervises one of our therapists, Maddie Lawler, and um, 
uh, which was one of our other awesome therapists. And so I'm just really excited to hear what she's going to share with us today. So take it away, Jill. All right. And thank you. Um, so we have a lot to get through today in particular. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the ABCs of EBTs. And if that is confusing to you, it's okay. <laughs> the goal is that we can decipher what the many, many, many acronyms in mental health treatment mean. We can understand what an evidence-based therapy is. We can determine, hopefully at the end of this, right, the common evidence-based therapies for mental health disorders in children, um, and understand some of the common terminology and phrases that are coming from our evidence-based therapies, and really know how to be an informed consumer moving forward. So when we're looking for evidence-based therapy, what should we be looking for? What should we be asking for? Um, first and foremost, my disclaimer, I have a couple here because one, <laughs> I cannot get to every single evidence-based therapy or evidence-based practice for every single mental health disorder. I will miss a few. It does not mean that they are not evidence-based. It means we only have 45 minutes. <laughs> um, so I won't get to every single thing today. I also want to note that I am not an expert in every single thing I'm going to talk about today. So some things I am an expert in and I'll be sure to share those treatments with you. And I can certainly talk in depth and all day long about those treatments. There are others that I do not practice. That's one of the key things about evidence-based therapy. It takes a long time to get trained in specific modalities. So we don't really expect providers to be experts in everything. And if anything, we might have more questions if that were the case. So this can feel really confusing. It can feel so confusing because if you have a child with a mental health disorder, you can hear a million and one acronyms and have no idea what they mean and have no idea what's important for your child or what's most going to be most helpful for your child. So I'm hoping that today we can understand a little bit and get down to the nitty gritty of what some of these evidence-based therapies treat and how we know if they would be helpful for your child. Of course, it's always really important to be consulting with your child's pediatrician, to be asking their teachers about things, to be talking to the school personnel, right? School psychologists, school counselors, school mental health providers, be talking to a lot of therapists if you're looking for a therapist for your child. Um, we definitely don't want to get information overload, but we want to be an informed consumer. And that's a really, really hard balance and a hard line to walk. But hopefully this will help. <laughs> um, so let's think about why this is important. Could actually start at the bottom. This is a really surprising fact for many people. It takes about 17 years. The average is about 17 years for a new therapy to claim efficacy, right? Claim that it is effective in treating a mental health disorder and medical treatments as well to actually go into practice. That is a really, really huge length of time. And the reason for that is that it takes a long time to disseminate mental health treatments, to disseminate evidence-based treatments. We also want to make sure that clinicians are getting trained in those treatments appropriately, that they're not you know, reading a quick book and going and implementing it tomorrow, or they're not taking a one-hour training and going and implementing a treatment tomorrow. We want to make sure that they're doing it to the best of their ability, but also to fidelity. We wanna make sure that every evidence-based treatment is done with fidelity to the original manualized treatment. So 17 years takes like, it sounds like a really long time and it is. There will always be a lag in between research and implementation, unfortunately. Um, also just takes a ton of resources. It takes a ton of time. So it's important to remember that if You've heard of a hot new treatment and your therapist isn't doing it or you can't find much information about it. It might just be emerging and it might still be in development, right? So we want to, again, think about that in the context of this work. 
Now, it matters to think about evidence-based treatments for kids because quite frankly, we're the ones picking the child's treatment. There are wonderful, amazing therapies out there for kids, for adults, for adolescents. Um, but for kids, we wanna always try to make sure that our treatment can be very skills-based if that is the best thing for them. For ADHD in particular, this affects almost 10% of children aged three to 17 years old. Uh, anxiety, again, about 10%. 9.4%, but a huge amount of our kiddos are struggling with both internalizing disorders as well as externalizing disorders. Behavior problems are the number one reason that parents call a clinic or a private practice such as small frequent psychology. Uh, those affect again, upwards of 9% of children in the United States ages three to 17 years old. And depression, again, a smaller number, but still an incredibly high amount of children. So it matters to know what we're treating our kids with. And it's incredibly important. Um, just like you would wanna ask a lot of questions about medical treatment, again, we wanna do the same for mental health treatment. It can feel very confusing, but it still needs just as much research just as much exploration, we really want to kind of delve into the, the meat of things. Did I skip a slide? I did. Okay. Um, so we have to think about first, what is evidence-based treatment? So here's my first acronym of the day. Evidence-based treatment or an EBT, commonly referred to evidence-based practice, EBT, P, <laughs> I get confused too, don't worry. Um, this essentially means that it is backed by research. There is good scientific evidence to suggest that this is the most preferred or best practice for treating the symptoms that you're coming to a therapist with. One of the most important things is that the therapist you're working with has the specialized training in these EBPs, okay? The letters behind their name don't matter as much. I know that's hard to think about and hard to believe. We certainly want you to be working with licensed practitioners that are specialized in child mental health. And we wanna make sure that a practitioner is working within their specialty. Like I said before, if you meet a therapist and they say that they specialize in do, 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 and they list off 10, 15 acronyms, I might have a little bit of a yellow flag, right? Maybe not a red flag, but maybe a yellow flag. I might think to myself, oh, I know it takes a couple years to get trained for DBT. It takes at least a year to get trained for PCAT. I knew those two things are very different, right? Those two even symptom presentations can be very different how could you be an expert in all of these treatments? So the clinical expertise here is really important to think about. It does not mean we discount those professionals. It does not mean that they are not experts in those things. We just wanna learn more, right? Um, a lot of the trainings or a lot of the treatments that we specialize in for evidence-based practices, they require advanced training. They require postgraduate training. They require at least a year, sometimes more, of clinical supervision utilizing that training. So we wouldn't expect a therapist to know and to be an expert in everything. Um, so the clinical expertise, again, is so important. There are great websites that I'll show you at the end of this training that go through how you can find these practitioners. If you know I'm going to use PCAT because it's what I do, parent-child interaction therapy, which I'll talk about on the next slide. If you know PCAT sounds great for your kiddo and what they're experiencing, perhaps you go on PCAT.org and you look for a clinician that is specialized in that treatment, and then you find a clinician based off of that, right? So looking through those specific uh, avenues to really find folks that are credentialed and find folks that are uh, specialized and certified in these training, in these treatments rather. Okay. So 
ADHD and behavioral disorders. Um, so ADHD and behavioral disorders. So uh, you're going to see at the very bottom of my screen on the, the bottom right hand corner, I have two little icons that will show up. And the first one is this family group. This indicates that this is that the trainings and the treatments on the treatments rather on the slide are best for the family. It might be that the treatments are parent only treatments. It might be that they involve school or other adults in the child's life, or it might be a family treatment. And then the next slide you'll see, I have an individual icon that specifies that it's best for individual therapy. Again, I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but hopefully this will give us kind of a good overview. So for ADHD and behavioral disorders, the best thing we can do for our kids is to shape the environment around them. So the very first recommendation typically with an ADHD or behavioral disorder is behavioral parent training. Behavioral parent training can come in many different shapes, forms, um, two in particular that are very common in the New York City area and are very common throughout the United States are parent-child interaction therapy, PCIT, <laughs> or parent management therapy, PMT. PMT um, is typically used for kiddos three to 18 years old, and it really works through a parent-only lens of shaping the behaviors in the home environment. So we're utilizing a lot of positive reinforcement skills, implementing appropriate consequences when needed, and making sure that the home environment is best set up to support the child. PCIT, or parent-child interaction therapy, is a treatment that we do for as little as 18 months to seven years old. And this is a live coaching treatment. So this is a really special treatment. It's one, again, these are two that I specialize in personally. This is a treatment where we're coaching the parent and child dyad together. And we're focusing on building the relationship and the bond and rapport that the parent and child have together, making sure that attachment is as secure as possible, while then implementing some positive reinforcement skills throughout and implementing appropriate consequences as needed. We also think here about positive antecedents. How can we, again, shape the child's environment to make it most successful for them? When we do that, we also think about school consultation. We know that every school is not built for an ADHD kid. So oftentimes we'll get in the school, we'll try to support the teachers, especially if parents are in behavioral parent training, we always try to make sure that school and the teachers are using the exact same language. So we might get into the school and we might say, whoa, this classroom's super overwhelming. Let's remove that and that. And let's make sure that the class rules positively stated are right up in front of the classroom so the child can easily see them. Let's try to implement a behavior chart, a positively framed behavior chart that will support them in the classroom. This can be done in school. This can be um, uh, done with a school therapist or a school counselor, a school psychologist, for instance or even sometimes the teachers, or it can be done with an outside provider. So this in particular for ADHD and, and behavioral disorders, the best evidence-based therapy is going to be working with the environment, shaping the environment to make sure that it is the most successful for the child. All right, so let's see down here, we have our individual slide. I'm gonna start at the, Middle. Um, so cognitive behavioral therapy is a therapy that you're going to hear me state quite often today. Cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT <laughs> is a therapy that we typically will use for our internalizers, meaning we have internalizing symptoms and externalizing symptoms. Internalizing symptoms typically look like anxiety, depression, the typical kind of presentation that we think of. Externalizing looks more like aggressive behavior, disruption in the classroom or at home, uh, not listening, right? So we have internalizing and externalizing. 
Throughout history, we've used CBT for internalizing behaviors, meaning for anxiety and depression. There is a lot of emerging evidence to show that CBT can also be quite useful for ADHD. Um, and what this is, is it's really a focus on the psychoeducation piece of ADHD for both parents and for the child. We want to think about how can we help the child understand the importance of organization and planning? How can we bring some of those organizational skills into a CBT session? And then from the cognitive piece, so from the thinking piece, right, we always think about how can we help children restructure any negative cognitions or unhelpful cognitions and build coping skills. And this can be extremely important, especially for the emotional dysregulation that typically coincides with an ADHD diagnosis or can coincide. One thing to note too is one size doesn't fit all with all of these. <laughs> um, I'll talk about this towards the end too, but if this doesn't ring true for your kiddo with ADHD, that's okay. There are a lot of different options. Again, this is a not anywhere near an exhaustive list. It can't be, that would take hours. Um, summer treatment programs are a really wonderful uh, immersive experience for kids to essentially go to a summer program or a summer camp that integrates a lot of uh, effective positive reinforcement skills and behavior modification through academic activities or recreational activities. There's typically a really positive behavior system that we use in summer treatment programs. And there's a huge social skills component. Um, we know social skills training is really wonderful and so essential for children. And we also know that it is going to be the most effective when we can implement social skills training in the environment in which the child is with those other peers. So I'll say that again. Social skills training is most effective when it's done in that same environment, not in a different environment. So if we have social skills training in the classroom that the child is surrounded by those peers, that's going to be more effective or in a summer treatment program, that's going to be more effective than a child going once weekly to a group social skills training. It does not mean that's not effective. It means group or outside social skills training just requires a higher level of practice. We have to practice those muscles. We have to provide tons of reinforcement to make sure that those skills learned outside of that environment are generalized in other environments. Okay, I know that can be so tricky. Um, organizational skills training is another one. So this is where we really help kids with ADHD learn how to best organize their environment. How can we have a system on their desk at school that works for them to create positive time management and planning skills. This is um, something that is often done also with tutors, right? But organizational skills training can be really helpful to work with a therapist as well to really hone in on that organization planning side of ADHD. All right, so we're gonna shift over to anxiety and OCD. So from an individual lens, again, when we're thinking about individual EBTs, cognitive behavioral therapy is usually our gold standard. This can come in a couple of different forms. There are many different workbooks that a therapist might go through with a child. There are definitely different manualized treatments that come from a CBT lens. Um, the, the one that I always think about is Coping Cat. So that might be by Phil Kendall. That might be something that you hear a therapist mention. Um, that's a really great workbook for younger children to go through anxious thoughts and learn how to reframe and restructure anxious thoughts um, and helps them to develop coping skills, right? Like muscle relaxation, deep breathing exercises, uh, exposure and response prevention, ERP. <laughs> um, is typically the prolonged and gradual use of exposures in situations that create anxiety and distress. 
So what we do as therapists is we typically will help kids. Again, usually we're thinking about older kids here, right? For any kind of cognitive work, it's usually good to think about seven, eight years old is usually the earliest that we can do cognitive work. Um, some kids can receive it earlier in cognitive work. I simply mean cognitive behavioral therapy, ARP. Some kiddos can do it earlier. We want to think about the developmental age versus chronological age. Kids with ADHD typically present developmentally slightly younger than their chronological age. So for them, right, we might do CBT at 9, 10, 11 years old, and we might really focus on the behavioral parent piece to start. For kids with anxiety, sometimes they're so aware of their thoughts and emotions that we can do it at an earlier age, right? Maybe we start at seven for those kids. It is so dependent on the individual child. Um, and hopefully a good therapist will also be able to assess that, right? They can, they can trial out a session and see how much the child can tolerate and what they can handle. So ERP, sorry, coming back to that. So ERP is typically done by created a fear hierarchy with children and their families. Um, and a SUD scale is something you might hear from a therapist that just re refers to uh, the subjective units of distress scale. So we're looking at how distressing is this experience for the child? So if a child has social anxiety, they might rank uh, returning a shirt at H&M in you know, a really high a seven on that sub scale, but they might rank calling and ordering a pizza number two, right? It's not so high. And so we can gradually work up that hierarchy with the child and help them learn how to tolerate their anxiety. Habit reversal training or HRT, this is done um, very commonly too with uh, body focus repetitive behaviors or BFRBs. <laughs> um, this is the process of developing awareness for a habit and developing a competing or alternative response. I don't know why that skipped ahead again. So the family modalities that we can use, again, this is not an exhaustive list. But one emerging uh, family and parent training modality that has come up recently in, in the last decade um, was born out of Yale is supportive parenting for anxious childhood emotions or space. There was a great, I want to say Times article on it. I might have gotten that wrong, but there was a really great article on this treatment in particular, and it was very hot for, for a couple years. Um, this is a treatment that I do as well. So this is a behavioral parent training that works to actually reduce family accommodations that are typically reinforcing anxious behaviors. And what that means is that when we have an anxious child, one, we most often have anxious parents because genetics. <laughs> and number two, we are often reinforcing anxiety inadvertently. And what that might look like is if you have a child that says, oh, I'm scared to be in the kitchen alone because it looks like there might be a ghost out my window and I'm a little fearful of that, then you're in the kitchen with them and you don't let them be alone there. And then all of a sudden next week they say, I don't want to be in the bathroom alone. Okay, so every time he goes to the bathroom, now you're in there. And now oh, I can't sleep alone. Okay. Now you're sleeping at the bottom of his bed, right? And so all of a sudden, over time and gradually, we now have a ton of separation anxiety and fears of being alone. And that happens over time. And so gradually that we often forget and we don't even notice it's happening until we realize we're accommodating so much anxious behavior. And we want parents to start learning how to support their child in being braver. This is also a really awesome treatment for children that won't engage in their own individual treatment. So this is a great treatment that we can use for kids that either are unable or uh, don't want to, unwilling to engage, or are just not ready for, for a couple of different reasons, right? Maybe they're a little too young, um, or maybe there is so much parental accommodation that that would be most effective for us to treat first. 
that's a parent only treatment. A parent child treatment that we can do for, again, younger kids, PCAT, calm. You can also just do parent coaching with exposures. Um, again, a good evidence based therapist will be able to do this with you. What this is, is simply doing for younger children, coaching parents to guide their child through exposures. Okay, so if I'm really, really afraid of uh, the snake, right? A snake. I get a fake snake, it sits outside of the room, maybe a real snake from feeling daring, right? And then gradually we bring the snake a little bit closer, right? We're practicing just that exposure because we're helping kids and parents tolerate their anxiety. So these are family interventions that are typically used for anxiety, OCD, again, social anxiety, generalized anxiety, phobias, selective mutism, you name it. We have a lot of interventions that we can use for anxiety. So depression and mood disorders, um, and we think about also just emotional dysregulation a bit here too. Again, that number one gold standard treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy. But what this does from a, from a depression lens is that we're really focusing on identifying negative or uh, automatic negative thoughts for the child and trying to shape those to be more helpful and realistic thoughts. We also introduce a lot of coping skills, just like I mentioned before with CBT. We introduce behavior activation. Sometimes this is referred to as BA, um, just because we have to throw another acronym in there. Um, behavioral activation. So this can be, again, rating and noticing how your mood can change after you do an activity that is enjoyable for you. Um, and this is one way of sh uh, showing children and adolescents that they actually have a lot of control over their mood. Acceptance and commitment therapy and interpersonal psychotherapy. These are two evidence-based therapies. IPT typically focuses on the maladaptive thoughts and actions and behaviors within the family system and the relationships. Um, and then ACT simply refers to accepting uncomfortable or negative challenges and experiences um, and delves quite a bit into also just mindfulness. Another individual treatment for children with depression and mood disorders is DBT. The reason I have this on my family slide, however, is because DBT in its truest format is done in multiple sessions per week, um, and it's typically done with a family focus. So for instance, we have individual therapy for the child, but we also have family group therapy. We also have just parent-only therapy sometimes, depending on the DBT uh, that, that's recommended for the child. And this is a practice where we're really working to increase the distress tolerance and improve relationships, typically, again, within the family, but also with peers. There's a heavy focus on mindfulness practice as well in DBT. This can be particularly helpful for, for especially teenagers um, or older children that are experiencing self-injurious behaviors or suicidal ideation. And then finally, family-focused therapy is another therapy I do not do, but um, this is a therapy that focuses on psychoeducation. So if a child in the family has a diagnosis, such as depression or bipolar disorder, especially with FFT, this is a therapy that focuses on providing psychoeducation to the family and to the child or uh, adolescent, mostly in this case and then developing coping skills together. And there's a huge focus here too on problem solving and reducing familial conflict through group problem solving. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these for the sake of time, but these are common terms, common phrases we use a lot in evidence-based therapy. So thought records, keeping track of negative or unhelpful thoughts, patterns, thinking traps or cognitive distortions, identifying such as black and white thinking, right? Are you thinking in all extremes? Are you catastrophizing, making something really small, really big in your minds? Behavior towards positive reinforcements, 
uh, behavior tracking, consequences, active ignoring. There are many, many terms that you can hear from an evidence-based therapist. This is one way of, again, just kind of knowing some of the skills that might be used through evidence-based therapies. Um, and it's also great to research some of these skills. Ask your therapist, hey, I'm curious if you've ever tried progressive muscle relaxation with her. I think it would be really helpful. You can Google progressive muscle relaxation and find thousands of videos to practice at home with your kid, right? That's just quite simply tensing up muscles to be able to practice relaxing our body. Um, there are a lot of these mindfulness that we can practice on our own. We don't necessarily need to have them all integrated into therapy. So some of the core components of an evidence-based therapy. So parental involvement is typically really important. And one key factor here is that this is so dependent on a child's age, developmental level, and the problem they're coming with. Um, and the intervention that's being performed. We will have less, inherently less parental involvement with a teenager than we will an eight-year-old. Um, that is because we respect the confidentiality of all ages, and we know that therapy skills are like a muscle. We have to practice them. If we go to the gym once a week for 45 minutes, we might see a little Improvement. But if we go to the gym 45 minutes once a week, but we come home and we practice push ups or sit ups for 10, 15 minutes a day, even every single day, we're going to see far more improvement in that way than if we just leave it to once a week. So we have to think about building a muscle here, right? Therapy skills are like building a muscle. And typically for children, nothing comes automatically. We want to make sure we can say, uh, hey, just like when we practice that belly breathing or just like when we practice PMR, that would be a great thing to have done in that situation. Let's practice it again, right? It's just like a muscle that they're working to build. Um, routine outcome measures. So there are tons of evidence-based um, measurements and symptom tracking that we're typically using. In some ways, we can be doing this with the child, depending on the age. In a lot of ways, we do this with the parents too. Typically, an evidence-based treatment will consist of regular out uh, routine outcome measures. Um, and again, ask the therapist, what are they using? That's a great question for them. Uh, a short-term commitment. So therapy is not a uh, um, uh, small commitment. It is a large commitment. We often tell parents to expect that the very least a 12-week commitment. Um, it could be more. It could be less. Almost every single evidence-based therapy out there is 12 weeks. I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure at least the ones that I already went through at the very, very, very least, you're looking for the three to four month commitment. And most often it could be slightly longer. Again, that could depend on the child. That could depend on the parent progress. So it could be slightly longer. I always say 12 to 20 is usually a really good estimate. Um, but it is a short-term commitment. Our goal as evidence-based therapists is that your child is not in treatment forever. We want them to learn skills. We want them to feel comfortable with the skills. Sometimes kids need more supportive therapy moving forward, but from the evidence-based work, we wanna make sure that they feel confident with skills and practicing those skills in that shorter period of time. Again, the home practice is so important. So one key thing to mention here is that medication is often a huge component when we're looking at the research studies um, on evidence-based treatment. So medication as, as a combined treatment for with uh, therapy or an evidence-based treatment is typically going to show the highest level of efficacy. Um, meaning if we do medication alone versus therapy alone, those are going to show lower efficacy than if we put them together. Makes sense, right? Um, so medication is really important and may be recommended by your therapist. 
again, not everybody uh, wants to engage in medication and that's okay. It's important to weigh the pros and cons with trusted, you know, friends that have gone through the same experience, your family's practitioners, your pediatrician, your child's therapist, uh, your child's psychiatrist, if they've engaged in, in using a psychiatrist as well. Uh, so we want to make sure that when we're thinking about engaging in an evidence-based treatment, we talk to a lot of people. <laughs> um, as you can see, and as you've probably have seen from exploring every, any therapist, especially in the last couple of years with COVID, a lot of people do this work and we want to vet everybody, right? Not to the degree of, again, of getting information overload, but we wanna be able to ask questions, right? Are you, if you're a PCAT therapist, are you a certified PCAT therapist? That's a great question to ask, right? What training did you get for CBT? It's a great question to ask. It's okay to ask some of those questions. It's also okay to shop around, again, to an extent. Notice when you're getting information overload. If you have no idea where to start based off of what I've just gone through, if you have no idea of DBT or CBT or whatever is going to be most helpful, call someone to do an intake. Call one of us, call a therapist. We're the ones that can help you decide what will be most helpful moving forward. You don't need to make these decisions on your own. And when you're engaged in therapy with a child, it's great to have those open conversations with their provider. How can I be practicing this at home? How can I reinforce these skills? Um, how are you measuring her progress? Well, how can I be a part of that measuring, right? How can I chat with you after the session? How can I uh, meet with you on a regular basis? We also want to acknowledge, again, that this is hard work. This is similar to going to a gym. <laughs> There's a reason a lot of people don't do it, right? It's a lot of hard work at the very beginning, and it's a lot of hard work throughout those 12 to 20 weeks. Um, kids can move at their own pace, and we want to meet the child where they are. So if there doesn't feel like a ton of progress, have those conversations with your child's provider and ask them their thoughts. It might be that the child is really struggling to engage in a certain skill, but you can reinforce it at home in a certain way. Um, and then finally, feel free to look at the research and <laughs> know that all research is not alike. We always want to think about keeping an eye on the science behind the research if there's a trial that you're reading about, like, like a clinical trial, how many people were involved in the trial? How many times has this trial been replicated? Was the design a randomized control trial or not, right? That's usually one of the gold standard treatment uh, um, clinical trials. Uh, are reputable sources touting this treatment? If you go to cdc.gov, do they talk about this treatment? If you go to effective therapy.org or childtherapy.org, do they talk about this treatment? How can I find more information out that feels reputable um, and well-researched? At the end of the day, we're going to open up to questions in a second. At the end of the day, we want to make sure we trust the professionals and you know your child best. If you feel like something's not working, if you have questions, just talk, ask your pro child's provider and advocate for them if you need to. At the end of the day, therapists are there to support your child. We don't get into this for any other reason, I promise. <laughs> um, we're here to support your child and to support your family. And we want to make sure that we are working together as a team in the best way possible. When we have some children with comorbid disorders, meaning they have more than one diagnosis, it can get really tricky, right? We might need to prioritize one treatment over another one, but we want to do the other one eventually, right? Have those conversations. Ask them, hey, I can see that this is focused, this treatment is focused on her aggressive behavior, but when will we tackle that anxiety? What's the treatment plan look like? What does this look like over time? It's okay to ask those questions. So here I have a couple of different websites. There are others, but 
honestly, this is a great place to start. Um, these three over here on the left-hand side, effectivechildtherapy.org, div12.org, uh, 12 ABCT, these are three great places to start. This one in particular, div12.org, uh, is an APA organization website, so um, American Psychological Association, and it's the Division for Child and Adolescent Psychology. This is a really fantastic resource because it shows the specific modalities and any new research coming up on those modalities. Again, these are some diagnosis-specific information sites. They can be really helpful to find therapists, especially. All right, and finally, if you are even more confused after this, which I hope is not the case, feel free to call us. And we're always, always, many and I especially are always more than happy to talk you through this conversation. We're happy to, again, just start at the, at the very beginning and walk you through what some of this means in a more in-depth way. Um, and just even guide you to the best resources too, if needed. If you just want some more books to read, if you need anything else, we're always happy to kind of help. Thanks so much, Jill. Of um, just the thing I need is another book to put on my <laughs> table, the stack of books this high. <laughs> oh, yeah, I get it. <laughs> which, is why, which is why calling us will be a more effective use of your time, right? <laughs> um, super helpful. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really impressed with how easily you distilled all of those acronyms and I'm sure everybody is an expert right now. Right. Um, but it was, a, it was a lot of really good information. Um, some, of, so we definitely got a lot of questions. I'm going to try and get through as many of them as we can. Um, you know, some of the questions concern some of the specific things that, um, that, uh, you haven't specifically talked about. Oh, one person is asking if you would return to the resources slide, I think just so they can copy down. Yeah, that one. All right, so let's, let's just leave that up for a sec. Um, so uh, autism, that was a question that came up. Is there something that you would recommend for helping kids who have an autism diagnosis? It's a really great question. So it, autism is typically best treated again through research with ABA or applied behavioral analysis or behavioral treatments. Um, there are a lot of different components to autism. And so oftentimes we have to treat the secondary symptoms that are coming up, right? And that might be aggression or violent behavior that can always be supported through parent only treatments such as PMT. There's a lot of different parent treatments too that are specific to autism. Um, as well as social skills training, again, social skills training in the child environment. So I like nest programs are so amazing in New York City, specifically in the child's environment can be most effective, but making sure that we're working again with the parent and the child together. Um, and as the child gets older, and if they are able to engage in their own individual therapy, CBT can be really helpful for kids with autism too. Um, and, and just learning about kind of some of like the social pragmatic communication and learning about their own feelings identification. So that can be a helpful piece too. But typically those behavioral parent trainings are a great place to start. Sweet. And then the other big thing that came out had to do with trauma. There are a couple of different parents who are trying to support their kids as they're going through a high conflict divorce, uh, their trauma and other sorts of areas. And so what do you recommend for those kinds of kids? Yeah, it's a great question. So TF, <laughs> TFCBT. Get another acronym. I don't know. <laughs> Something about our field. We can't remember it, but TFCBT, <laughs> trauma-focused uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is a great treatment um, that we can use. I believe it goes down to six years old. Again, don't quote me on that, but that can go a bit younger. Um, and that's a way in which we support kids uh, looking through the process of understanding the trauma that they experienced. Mm -hmm. So that can be really helpful uh, in treating trauma. EMDR is also another evidence-based therapy for adults that typically treats trauma. I don't know the efficacy for children or adolescents. Um, yeah, so I don't know that for sure, but definitely for yeah. adults, there is really good emerging research on that. Awesome. Yeah, it's not, EMDR is not something that we do at our practice, although a couple of our therapists are uh, trained in TFCBT. So um, we can help you find people who can use those 
uh, modalities. Uh, someone is also asking if art therapy is considered to be an EBT. That's a great question. Um, to my knowledge, I don't believe so. And I will say there are also skills that a lot of art therapists bring in that can be really helpful that are evidence-based. Again, a lot of art therapists with a background of evidence-based therapy can integrate a lot of deep breathing, a lot of progressive muscle relaxation. So a lot of times, and I, I saw this question come up for schools too, a lot of times those providers, uh, such as school counselors, can bring in a lot of evidence-based skill set. Is it a manualized treatment? Typically, or at least to my knowledge, no. However, a lot of the skill building can be evidence-based. Yeah, actually, and, and this is a really good uh, lead into my next question, which is, you know, people are talking, are asking how can these EBTs be used together? What if my particular situation doesn't lend well to a particular EBT? And so I'm just wondering, like, what do you think about adapting some of these things, um, say in a school or in an art therapy uh, room or just for, you know, whatever situation that you need that you think is not gonna work out? How do you go about adapting these things and can you adapt them and not lose the efficacy that comes from really following a manualized treatment? So hard. So I always think of the term like uh, being fidelitous, but flexible <laughs> or uh -huh. flexible with infidelity. Right. And yeah. I think you can. And <laughs> um, <laughs> it's really important to know if you're not getting the EBT as prescribed. Um, so I think it's really helpful if to, to have that conversation, if you think mm -hmm. again, that a, a certain skill would be helpful, or if you feel like a little bit, you need it a little bit more piecemealed for your child, that's okay to bring up to a therapist, but you do want to make sure that you understand as the parent and hopefully the therapist would do this conversation, right? They would have this conversation with you that you are not receiving the prescribed treatment, but you're mm -hmm. receiving it from like a piecemeal way. Um, and again, good therapists can certainly do that. We just want to make sure parents are aware of that. And the same with school providers, right? School providers are the first to say they're not therapists, they're counselors. And it can feel very similar for, for parents, but it's typically not exactly the same. Typically school providers and school counselors are there to support children with situations that are going on in the school environments. They're not yeah. necessarily focused on the things that are going on at home. Um, and again, this is also so dependent on the, the, the counselor too. So, right. um, but, but the likelihood of your child getting a traditional two fidelity manualized treatments in school is probably low. Again, yeah. I'm happy to be, be proven wrong and I certainly could be. But typically, those are treatments that are received outside of school. Yeah. Just like kind of like a school nurse, right? A school nurse is going to administer medication for ADHD halfway through the day. If you need it for the afternoon hours, they're not going to prescribe the medication, right? They're not going to necessarily do exactly the same thing. Yeah, that's a really good metaphor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, yeah, so I know one of the things that we, uh, we try to do as a practice is to work with therapists who really understand the research behind the EBTs, really know the EBTs inside and out, and then can also make adaptations when needed for the family, because nothing is ever going to be like exactly yeah. as it, yeah, the, the model family or whatever, that's never the case. So finding people who understand what it means to still maintain fidelity to the program, but knows how to ad adapt it, I think is really important. And I love what you said about just asking that question. I think that a lot of parents, I think, feel uh, uncomfortable with questioning the therapist. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm always a big advocate for that, that in, in, especially when you were talking about being an informed consumer, I think parents need to be informed consumers and ask those questions, even if it might feel uncomfortable. And the right therapist for you is not going to take that personally and is not going to react mm -hmm. defensively against that. Um, but that's another uh, good question somebody brought up is like, how do you, do you have any advice for how to choose a therapist? Say you've chosen, you know, the, you, you think you have a good idea of what kinds of EBTs you want to do for your child. 
you've found some therapists who have the skills to do that, then how do you narrow it down? What's the best way of trying to find a therapist that's going to be the right fit? Well, I think first and foremost, looking at the the therapist bio and researching a bit about them and making sure that the kids that they work with, right, based off of their internet bio or based off of, off of what you can see even from Google search, right, the kids that they work, how they have experience working with sound like your children, right? Because mm-hmm. you might have a therapy in mind. There are plenty of kids that say, or parents that say, you know, I need DBT. And we talk to their children or that we talk to them and their child is four years old. And they're not going to get DBT for their four-year-old, right? So you might have a therapy in mind and it actually might not be the best one for your child. So to some extent, we want to interview providers to learn that, right? Do they agree with what you have in mind or is, are they going to recommend something different? And that's okay. Again, that's where it comes back to, at a certain point, we do have to trust the professionals and prof- trust the opinions we're getting pretty yeah. consistently. Um, but when you do talk to that provider, again, ask about <laughs> certifications, ask about where they learn specific therapies. Again, it can be very awkward to have those conversations but it's okay to ask, right? How many kids have you treated with OCD? How do I know if my kiddo is getting better? How do I know if my teen is getting better and and she's practicing her exposures when she doesn't want to tell me anything about therapy afterwards? Mm -hmm. That's so hard. You know, it's really tough. So I think it's okay to, again, ask those very pointed questions. Is there a certificate that you get for DBT? There is, but is there a certificate you get for DBT? Is there a certificate you get for PCIT? How can I learn about what that process even looks like? How important do you think personality fit is? That's a great question. I think it's yeah, especially fun. like <laughs> really, yeah. also, all right. So how do you how important do you think it is relative to the training and the certifications? Well, like I- so, like <laughs> if you have somebody who's highly trained but doesn't quite feel personality fit or you have somebody that you really really like but maybe is a little less trained do you have an opinion I mean this is totally subjective of course (laughs) totally subjective so straight opinion in your informed in your informed position what what do you think parents are asking what we know from research I have to come back to it is that actually kids can get better if they feel a really great bond and attachment with the therapist even if there's no skills-based or evidence-based work being done. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. I think that it's really important to, to remember that too. I think personality, I think you can find both, especially in a place like New York City where you, <laughs> I, I read somewhere where right, you can throw from. a rock into a crowd and hit five <laughs> therapists, right? There's tons of therapists here. You can find a good fit for both, I believe. However, I think personality fit is so important. And that you might not make any progress if the personality fit isn't there. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Record. Um, do you, for, you were talking about space as a treatment for parents with anxiety. Do you think the parents also need to do their own therapy in tandem with the child in order to help the child maintain progress? That's a great so question. Space is a parent therapy. Um, but, or it's a, a parent treatment focused on the child as the patient, obviously, or as the client. Mm-hmm. But I think that it can be very useful, um, especially with it, as odd as it is. I actually think sometimes it's more effective to do individual therapy as the parent when you're engaging in parent trainings, um, mm-hmm. behavioral parent training, such as PMT, PCAT, SPACE, those bring up a lot of emotions and a lot of yeah. deep-seated insecurity. So I actually think parent training is usually most effective when parents can also engage in their own therapy and realize where these reactions and responses are coming from. That's a great point. Yeah. Uh, we are running out of time, so, but there's so many more questions. All right, how about group therapy? Any uh, evidence-based group therapies that you know of? Tons, yes, yeah. I can't leave them all. <laughs> I know, I know DBT yes. is one of them. Can you think of DBT like others? There's group CBT, there's group substance abuse therapies, there are group How about trauma and anxiety. Anything specifically? Anxiety, anxiety for sure. Trauma. Maybe just CBT oriented sure. group therapy. 
Yeah. And again, that the effective child therapy or no, the, the one underneath, actually both of those probably would answer that question. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and anger management. What would you suggest for anger management, especially <laughs> in teens? That's a great question. So uh, it's always important to think about where is it coming from? CBT can be really effective for anger management. Um, there are specific protocols for anger management that we typically use with teenagers, um, but CBT in general can be really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Again, reshaping, re reframing some of those negative cognitions, more of those automatic thoughts that come up. I also would always ask, again, how the parents are involved, how the parents are responding to that anger, how, how people around the child are modeling their anger, right? There's always so much we can shape in the environment because none of us are perfect. So I think that that's also a really, a really huge component to working with. Again, most of those externalizing behaviors or symptoms a lot yeah. of those externalizing symptoms typically do require a parent component. Yeah. Um, I would also say DBT could also be a good Indeed. place, right? Because if anger is just a response to feeling distress and it's their way of lashing out to like mm -hmm. regain control, um, DBT can really help with that. And there's also For a parent sure. component there too. Mm -hmm. um, all right. We are almost out of time, but there was one great question. Um, what do parents need most from their parents when they're receiving therapy? So what aside from what, what, what do kids need? What do kids need most <laughs> from their parents when the, when the kids are receiving therapy? So aside from the parent oriented treatment programs, say a kid is going through individual, or maybe they're going through family oriented stuff. What can the parents do to help support treatment in their kids? That's such a good question. I know, um, right? <laughs> I would say communication with the therapist is really big and knowing that the, the parent, no, having the child know that you are part of the team, I think is really important. Uh, making sure that the child knows that you're meeting with the therapist too, to learn about how best they can support the child um, and, and being open that some kids will talk a ton about what they, what they did in therapy. Other kids will not talk at all. And it is so painful mm -hmm. to know that fact, but it's also a space that we want to respect their confidentiality, but we want to be able to, again, practice some of those muscles and practice those skills mm -hmm. um, that kids learn in, in individual therapy. But I would say being supportive as possible. I always think about like I said, this is my last webinar, um, but I always think about like, <laughs> right, like our two E's being empathetic and encouraging, right? We yeah. always want to be empathetic. I know that was really hard, or I'm so proud of you for being so brave to go to therapy. This is really tough. You know, mom, dad haven't even gone until they didn't even go until they were 20. Um, and I know you can get over this. I know that you can, you know, build those brave muscles to start practicing these things in front of people. I know that you can, you know, we can work as a family to, to support you in overcoming this depression, anxiety, et cetera. Yeah. What do you, I know some therapists are actually really reluctant to talk to parents, especially in teen therapy. Yeah. Um, and I hear that from parents sometimes. What do you, what do you think about that? Is that, should therapists be trying to talk to parents or should, uh, or should they be uh, being completely mum about this the way some therapists are? It's a really good question. I think that the biggest thing is that we want parent and therapist to communicate. And we also want the child to know that they're communicating. What I always do with teens is ask them if I can share something. And most of the time, if they say no, they are still okay with sharing a skill, right? So if I say, hey, can I share with your parent or can we share together? how you use that skill in this situation you just described because it was so impressive to me and they say no which is okay right again we're going to respect confidentiality there and we want them to know it's their safe space usually if i say hey can i share the thinking traps or can i share uh the cognitive restructuring tool can i share just a tool right an objective concrete tool has nothing to do with your experience That's or the way that thing. you practice it. Yeah, that's a good point. Are more likely to do that. 
Um, and so maybe if we can finagle a way for, for, for parents to even ask that um, to be done, that can sometimes be helpful. Because it's actually really great. You know. And sometimes, again, I can just frame it in, oh, well, I think mom really might really benefit from this, right? She might really need to practice this. So let's help her too, right? And again, usually we can mm-hmm. get that kiddo to agree. Yeah. She can get off your back more if you just like, yeah. teach her that this thing is going to happen. <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, several people are asking if we were taking new clients. We, uh, we are, we are, we are almost like, we are probably like 95% full for after school and evening slots right now, but we do have a wait list and we are trying to get people in uh, the door as fast as we can because we do these EBTs that are more focused on, like Jill said, the 12 to 20 week uh, treatment. We uh, are able to have people come in and out more frequently than some people, some practices that are seeing patients for longer. So um, please always feel free to contact us. We will try to help you understand how long the wait list is. We do have some daytime slots for those parent oriented Mm -hmm. uh, uh, practices that Jill was talking about. And the summer is also a really great time to move in because a lot of it's like a natural transition point for some of our school based uh, or school year based kids and then Uh, they move on and we're able to get more people in the summer. So always feel free to reach out. Um, If you do want to have a consultation with any of us just to understand more about what what EBT might be helpful for you, um, I think any of our therapists would be happy to have a one-off appointment with you. Our neuropsychologist can certainly do the same. Uh, So the consultation, you know, is is also part of our service and uh, and we're happy to do that too. Um, Thank you so much for coming. We are going to be back next month for our last webinar of our yearly series. This is going to be a psychologist, Sam Janit, who's going to talk to us about how we as parents can help support our kids during bullying, whether they are being bullied or whether they are themselves the bully. Um, and, uh, and always feel free to reach out to us at Small Brooklyn Psychology. Thanks again to Park Slope Parents for helping us to get the word out. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. We'll be sending this recording and slides a little bit later today. Thanks very much.